Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to you to the World Economic Forum, to, uh, to wonderful snowy Davos that has fulfilled all of our dreams of what a uh, Alpine city should look like in the winter. Uh, and, and given us, some of us, some hope that uh, maybe we've got a few more years uh, on this earth. It's not, you know, maybe, maybe winter still loves us and cold weather's okay. As a Canadian, I'm very happy to see the weather out there. If I were a driver, I wouldn't be as happy, but uh, glad to see that you are all here. Uh, thank you to, uh, to you for coming to what I think is, um, and I'm biased, but I think it's probably one of the most important conversations we're going to have this week, given that the theme of uh, Davos this year is coming together in a fractured world, I think that we can no longer, I think I have a panel full of optimists, but you cannot, no matter how optimistic you are, uh, pretend that there are not fractures that require all of our attention to heal. Uh, many of the people on my panel have devoted their lives to, uh, in their own way, maybe not getting up every morning saying I'm healing fractures in the world, but they have been doing things, either studying it or healing it or fixing it or developing policy to fix it. And we need that expertise now more than ever. We are in a world where uh, there's no more margin for error in hoping that you're on the right side of fixing this problem because um, it is a fissure and it is growing around the world and we need to address it. So I want to introduce you. First of all, I want to tell you that um, I, I'm going to take questions from those in the room and those of you uh, watching this on the live stream. For those of you watching it, and frankly, if you're in this room, you can go to wef.ch slash ask. World Economic Forum, wef.ch slash ask, and you can ask your question. You can also see the uh, questions that are posted, and if you really like those questions, you can vote on them, uh, and that'll bring them to my attention even faster so that I can ask them. Also, for those of you in the room, I will be uh, there will be a, a microphone, and we'll be taking your questions, and we really would like your, your questions and input. The one thing I always have to warn people at the World <coughs> Economic Forum is that this is a gathering of some remarkably smart people, many of whom have very well-developed theses, uh, which we don't have the allotted time to hear the whole thing on. So I would ask that they, they try and stick us <laughs> to questions as much as possible. Uh, from um, the other uh, thing that I've done is I've, uh, I, I put out a, a poll on social media uh, asking people to what degree, I'll, ask, I'll tell you the question that I posted. I said, to what degree, what effect do you think culture has on politics? Now that may seem like a very obvious question to you uh, and to the folks that I asked on social media, it seemed obvious. 90% uh, of the people who responded to my Twitter question uh, believe that culture has either a major or some impact on politics. I guess that's a good, good response, uh, and I'm going to ask the, 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 the panelists about that. I guess we're happy that people think culture has an impact on politics, uh, otherwise at least two of my panelists uh, might be out of jobs. Uh, let me introduce my panelists to you, starting on your right, Karan Johar. Uh, uh, again, a lot of my panelists don't need an introduc introduction. He is uh, one of the most famous Indian film directors, producers, and screenwriters. He has a, a big movie coming out tomorrow, I believe. Tomorrow's the theatrical release? No. Very soon. No, no, I don't have a film. You, you don't have something that's releasing very <laughs> soon? No, unfortunately, not, not, not very soon. But All right, well, <laughs> soon. It'll be tomorrow one day. Yes. Um, <laughs> he's a TV host. He's a radio personality. True. But what he's really known for uh, is, is pushing cultural limits. Uh, and he does it in a country that uh, sometimes pushes back. And, and so that's a discussion we're going to have. For those of us in America who think we're the only people pushing back, we're actually fairly late to the game. Um, he's actually uh, cast a Pakistani in uh, a starring role of his uh, latest film. He's uh, stirred up controversy. Uh, and uh, he's the author of a new memoir called An Unsuitable Boy. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the, the struggles that you come up against and how you face them and seem to enjoy them. Uh, Arlie Hoschild is a professor of sociology at uh, University of California, Berkeley. She's the dire director of the Center for Working Families there. She studies the impact of globalization on social patterns. Uh, obviously, if you're here at the World Economic Forum, you have some sense of the import of globalization, positively or negatively. Well, Arlie studies this. She has also studied, uh, before it became fashionable for all of us to do so, the American right. Uh, and she's written a book uh, recently called Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right. And she's done a lot of work with people who are representing um, a group in America that has felt very left out and is now uh, 
reclaiming the stage in, in their opinion. We're going to talk a little about this. Her Excellency Alice Ba Kunke is the Minister of Culture and Democracy in Sweden. Uh, she uh, is a former television presenter, uh, and she has... Oh, that was a long time. <laughs> Same here. Um, she also founded a civil society think tank in, uh, in Stockholm and really brings a lot of that experience to bear in determining what a government's response should be to these challenges of, uh, of the weaponization of culture, something that they face in Sweden as well. Uh, and my old, old friend, Yo-Yo Ma, is not that old, he's my longtime friend, um, has been, I mean, he's really, it's so great to call him a friend because uh, he's so accomplished that it makes me feel more accomplished just by knowing him. Uh, he has been an accomplished uh, cellist. He's been uh, playing the cello since the age of four. Um, uh, he has uh, he's performed in every way that you can imagine, uh, in solos, uh, with orchestras, uh, in recitals. Uh, he's performed on 90 albums and won 18 Grammy Awards. And I would be in awe of him anyway, except for the fact that uh, almost 20 years ago, he uh, uh, started something called the uh, Silk Road. Uh, and it is, I, I'm going to ask him to describe it because I've, it's evolved in my mind so much. But fundamentally, when we think about the weaponization of culture, yo yo is the opposite of the weaponization of culture. He took things that I think it would have been very easy for everybody to weaponize, the fact that people have different cultures and speak different languages and play different instruments and listen to different music, and somehow his response to all of that is, wow, this would be terrific if they all just did it together. Um, so he has been thinking about this, maybe without actively thinking about it, uh, probably for all his life. So I, I cannot imagine a, a, a better panel, and I'm so happy, and I'm sorry for the long introduction because I'm going to get right to it. Um, the question of the role that culture plays in politics, and since I've got a minister of culture here, mm -hmm. uh, obviously in Sweden they think it's an important role and a necessary role. Yes, uh, we think that culture is, uh, of course, very important, essential, but uh, culture needs to be free to be culture. So uh, I always say that if culture, if the arts ain't free, then it's pointless. Uh, and that is nice words to say, but to do politics and policies around that, it means that my main purpose as the Minister of Culture in the, in the cabinet is to uh, defend the artistic freedom and to increase it with politics. So that means that we, during these uh, three, soon four years that we have been in government, we have, uh, for example, put laws in that will hinder politicians to stare our institutions. And it, this was a big debate. Uh, we really cut the rope between politicians and uh, our museums. We have a museum law making them free and independent as long as the law is there. Because we know that there are right-wing movements, for example, in Sweden, that really wants to use culture for a purpose to uh, define the nationalism and define. And that who you would are. be, in fact, this question of weaponizing culture. That yes, would be exactly. taking culture and using it not in the way that you're thinking about it, but to 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 create divisions in society. As exactly. Well. And another thing that we have done is to really increase the, the amount of the taxpayers' money going into culture in the whole of our country. Never before has so much money from the state budget gone to culture as today. Is there a lot of resistance to that? Uh, uh, well, uh, it is those who say, why is so much money putting into culture when we need it to uh, health care, to the police right. and to the military? And we say, and the Prime Minister say, and I, of course, as the Minister of Culture say, but we invest in our people, in our democracy, by investing in the free arts. Arlie, let me ask you about this, because in America, I don't know that people would say that culture doesn't play a role in politics, but there's really a question of what do you mean by culture, or whose culture? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly among some of the people you, you've studied, um, on the right, they have a feeling that their culture wasn't represented and that somebody's culture was out there, it just wasn't theirs. That's exactly right. Uh, what I did uh, was uh, start in my political bubble, which is uh, Berkeley, California, so uh, blue city, blue state, and figured that we're all in bubbles. Let me get into an equal and opposite bubble. How far right can I go? So uh, that would take me to the south and to the super south, that would be Louisiana into the oil country there mm -hmm. and to talk to blue collar whites uh, evangelicals. For five years I hung out uh, going back and forth. And, and you know, um, 
yeah, they don't uh, feel that seen, they feel put down. And um, let me, if I could just tell you a story of what happened to me. I, uh, I went there and said, hi, I'm Marley Hochschild, sociologist, blah, blah. And I'm writing a book. I, I know what I think, but I don't know what you think. And uh, we were split. And they said, well, um, yeah, you, you don't know who we are. And thanks for coming. And uh, I was at a meeting of uh, Republican women of Southwest Louisiana, around the table of eight, eight women. All of these became ardent Trump supporters. I didn't know that when I began. 2011, and uh, one said, oh, I love Rush Limbaugh. Well, he's a very conservative uh, uh, dominator of the uh, daytime radio um, and uh, 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 highly conservative. And so, and he's the person who says that environmentalists are environmental wackos and that feminists are all feminazis and so on. So I had a moment, I was trying to cross an empathy bridge and try and take my own alarm system off and be a listener. And to this woman, um, I said, you know, could we talk, say, have some sweet teas tomorrow? Would that work out? Yes. And you can explain to me why you love uh, Rush Limbaugh. So next day, sweet teas, we're sitting at a table. And uh, I asked her, um, well, thanks for coming, and, and yeah, so uh, what, what is it you love about him? Well, he hates feminazis. Well, I've, I don't know if you know We're what I'm We're still on that empathy bridge? Yeah, I, thought, <laughs> I thought, uh oh, I hope she hasn't Googled me. <laughs> um, and then I asked her, well, what is a feminazi? Well, it's a cold, hard, mean, ambitious woman who puts her children aside, her family aside. And I thought, whoa, who are we talking about? You know. Uh, but I just listened, you know, and then on environmental wackos uh, who are mean people who worship animals and think they're more important than people, wouldn't like that. Then she said, is it hard for you to listen to what I'm saying? Mm. But you told me you don't, you know, come from the same place and, and have these feelings. And I told her, you know, actually it's not hard at all. Uh, I have my alarm system off. I know about me, but you're really doing me an enormous favor, for which I'm really grateful, to let me know how, how you feel. And you know, her next sentence was, I know, I do that too. Yeah, I do that with my parishioners. I stop and listen. I do that with my kids. And then we had that in common. And then, so bond, we could both see both sides. Then it turns out that she was a gospel, extraordinary gospel singer in a uh, Pentecostal megachurch in Lake Charles. And she invited me to come and hear her sing. So I'm sitting in the front row. And, and then she got up and she sang a song for me. You know, but there were 700 people. Oh. <laughs> it isn't that hard if you really come from the right place, uh, I, I think. I, I know it is hard, but I, it's amazing how quickly you can. Uh, yeah, it's, you but that it's caveat, impossible. if you come from the right place, yeah. is I think the, the, the part. I mean, when you started talking about the empathy bridge, I was thinking, have we burned all those bridges? Are there empathy bridges left? So I think we need to explore that. And I think that the interesting concept that I just got in my mind about an empathy bridge is that it is on two sides. And, yeah. and, right. and everybody's got to make a bit of a journey. And I want to get to that in a moment, uh, the concept of tolerance of intolerance and, and uh, what, what those of us who don't think we're ripping the place apart need to do to rebuild it. Karen, I want to go to you for a second, though. Um, it's interesting to, to get out of the United States and realize that uh, Europe's got um, the weaponization of culture and it's been going on for a long time. But boy, in India, uh, I don't know if you can even ask a question like, is, does culture have an impact on politics? Culture and politics have been interwoven and intertwined and politics gets involved in culture quite a bit in India. 
Yeah, well, sometimes what happens is when, when, the, when the two get intertwined, it actually takes away from the real issues of the country. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, when we associate culture with history and historical facts, and the culture is very essential to our country. You know, we come from a very culturally rich country. It's in the DNA of our existence. It's the way we are. But it doesn't mean that you should, you should enforce it. You should imbibe it. And that's, my, that's always been my mantra. It's not that, you know, when politicians use culture for like their own personal purposes to incite, you know, the, uh, the, their, the voting audiences that they talk to sometimes, that really is bothersome because culture is intrinsically a part of who we are. It's what we are, but that's it. That's what we should be left aside. Let's talk about issues that plague our country. That no one wants to talk about. You know, we have, we have problems, we, are, we, we have problems economically, politically, socially, you know, we definitely have so many, so many issues that plague us on a daily basis. Sometimes those are just not addressed. Sometimes we're holding on to things, you know, where there could be one kind of minority group that will object to, a, say, a piece of creative work. You know, it's a film. It's a filmmaker's perspective. But suddenly you'll find mainline papers, politicians, everyone invested in a feature film. Like, while that's great, I feel very important that, you know, we, I'm a filmmaker, so obviously when the focus of the nation goes on to like our fraternity it's very empowering but it's also ridiculous mm -hmm. because we're making we're telling a story it's a percept like we have a recent release that's going to release the day after it's a film called Padma Vat. that's the one I was yes, talking about but that's not my film <laughs> oh uh, I okay. saw, I saw <laughs> what I meant was a film is <laughs> being released a film. very soon that is that not he my may film. see uh -huh. so it's or it's, may have been made by somebody from the same country it's actually <laughs> made it's made by a very genius filmmaker called Sanjali Lavansali, and he's been combating. Indicated. Yeah. <laughs> he's been combating the issue for like about like a year now, mm. and there's been so much. There's been a storm. Like everyone's talking about it. We have sectors and minor groups objecting to its release, vandalizing properties, oh. talking about the misrepresentation of history, talking about and the fact that it's. So this is on, the weaponization of culture. Yeah, so this yeah. is exactly but what we're talking about. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Why? Why is? I sometimes wonder why is the media reportage so excessive on this? Why are you empowering those people? Like, so my problem is, don't report, they won't be empowered. And if you don't empower question. them, then that will actually take care of the problem to a large extent. But here, everyone is stopping. Suddenly, I feel like there's so much happening. Thank God for, for you know, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who came to Davos, and some of the focus shifted, you know, <laughs> to find what, what really is the brass tacks of India, which is our Prime Minister talking about world business, as opposed to a feature film that is creating, like, this big storm in an elaborate teacup for no reason. I mean, it's a great feature film, and we feel really strong about it as an industry. But you have no idea what is happening. How if interesting. you go on social media, there are people vandalizing property. States are banning it, even though the Supreme Court has voted in favor of the film. Yet, there is that kind of destruction and violence that surrounds it. And everyone literally is praying on bended knees for its safe and smooth release day after. Wow. So it's actually what you're talking about is exceptionally relevant to the country we come from just now. How so when you talk about weaponization of of culture, I'm like, there's a strong difference. There is culture and then there's vulture. And the two cannot be integrated. But, 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 but mm. why do you think the reporting is the problem? That I find... So I'm going to actually, that's a good, and I want to I talk about that. I must defend that. the journalistic in, freedom. Because no, 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 I, think no I, I completely think that it should be reported. But sometimes there are reporters who don't actually understand the sensitivity of the situation. Because you empower some of the groups who actually are creating that kind of violence. But what is, the, the, the journalists are there to, to find out the truth, to, right. to investigate, to broaden their perspectives. I mean, they don't take side. Well, sometimes, unfortunately, right. they do. <laughs> and that's what happens. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying I'm all about the media. I'm a member of media myself. Like, I, I have a talk mm. show host. I have opinions on every. But I just feel sometimes you have to kind of, there's a fine line, you know, that, that goes between, like, opinion and reportage. And I think sometimes many members of the media, I can only speak about some of them in my country, some of them I respect deeply, and some of them I feel empower the wrong people. Well, at least you don't have the fake news like we have in America. Of course. Right. Wow. Um, you brought up something that I thought was really interesting, uh, and, and Yo-Yo had talked about it a, a few weeks ago when we were discussing it. I want to ask uh, the control room to put up uh, a Venn diagram uh, of the intersection that you were just talking about of <laughs> politics, <laughs> economics, and culture. Um, Yo-Yo, walk us through this, because we all uh, obviously dwell in the world of economics, unless you're, well, even if you're independently wealthy, you still have to dwell in the world of economics. Uh, we mostly dwell in the world of politics, because we've all got some of it in our lives. But your point is, if you are arguing, if you're f pushing back against the weaponization of culture, 
there's one spot on that diagram that is the best for you. It's your party. The green. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the green. It's the green spot. I think that's the spot that Arlie is talking about. That's the spot where people listen. And that's the spot where uh, culture is not subsumed by politics because it has, it's a different engine. Mm. I, I kind of think, you know, politics is about governing. Mm. And economics is about creating value. And culture is about creating values. And, and I think culture actually, when well-practiced, provides trust. So the currency of culture is trust. It's a shorthand for, you know, if you are, um, filmmakers understand one another, scientists under, understand one another, musicians can look at each other in the eye and then just immediately coordinate mm -hmm. and speak through the language of sound, but many, many layers get expressed. A look in the eye, Arlie, I know you come from Berkeley, yeah. we don't need to say anything more. Right? And just little bits of information can give you vast amount of information. So that, that green spot is where I would love to work more and more in, because I feel that if, you know, the topic from Davos this year, it's, you know, we live in a fractured world, well, the shared narrative is going to be in that green spot, is going to be when uh, the different languages of politics, economics, and culture come together so that we can serve humanity. Mm -hmm. It's not about serving a party or getting to, you know, mm -hmm. more people to come to a concert mm -hmm. or to, it's really about how we can actually uh, live a common goal. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to your point earlier, Ali, I, I don't think that, um, you know, that the, when we focus so much on what separates us, and we forget about that 99 point whatever percent of our genes are the same, mm -hmm. of our DNA is the same. So that tiny difference is what we focus all of our differences on. And you know, so I, I feel like there's something in that green spot that is worth looking at because if we're gonna solve our problems, it takes everybody. Mm. So one of the things, uh, Minister, that, that uh, we're struggling with in the United States, and there are you know, hundreds or thousands of examples around the world, but I'll just pick this one, this issue of uh, players kneeling at football games during the national anthem. This is uh, an issue that has become so politicized now that uh, Americans have taken uh, a view that is often expressed in polls about whether they are in favor of uh, or against these players being allowed to kneel during the national anthem and whether it's disrespectful or patriotic. <laughs> but in fact, the first time a player kneeled during the national anthem, it was a protest about uh, inequality in society, uh, uh, police violence, <laughs> things like that. And that doesn't come into the discussion anywhere. In other words, this, this underlying issue that some may believe is not important and some may believe is important isn't actually part of the discussion. Now when you ask somebody in America, what do you think of the players kneeling, it becomes about whether it's disrespectful or whether, wow. you know what I mean? So ultimately, the problem with weaponizing culture is that you can miss out on solving the actual problem that's underneath it. That's one of the problems with weaponizing culture. I mean, and that also what I am afraid of when it comes to, to Me Too and the movement we see all over the world and in Sweden, that we are, I mean, and there are four powers that want us to discuss the smaller things the the, 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 ones, the things that isn't the real problems, the structures when it comes to Me Too. And for example, uh, I mean, sometimes when these powers that want us to believe that different cultures can't interact, even though we know and the scientists tells us that the human being have been doing it for, for thousands and of Yo -Yo's years. And Yo-Yo's been proving <laughs> I mean, it for probably uh, 20 years. I mean, th those powers, they want us to believe that we can't be together and that we shouldn't be together. Uh, so by using the term uh, uh, as a struggles between cultures and cultural conflicts, we are really increasing, I mean, minimizing the real problems. Uh, so m that maybe is about hunger 
injustice, I mean, those real uh, big challenges that needs intellectualism, that needs uh, the people in powers that are really uh, willing to, to take the hard way, not the easy way out. Arlie, let's talk about um, uh, how you address people's grievances without inherently minimizing it. So you talked about your alarms being off. Uh, most of us don't have that skill to turn our alarms off. So somebody <laughs> says something that is inherently offensive to us or counter to how we see the world, um, how do you make that productive? Because it sounds like all of us all around the world are engaged in this. Uh, actually, I think we're all very good at it, mm. it's, uh, except that uh, we do it with our uh, loved ones, we do it with our children, we do it with our friends, we do it with our um, students. Uh, no problem, we're actually very skilled at it, but we just don't do it with people we think of as, quote, the other, you know, the enemy. So that's the only switch. You know, even before I, I left for this project, I'd tell people what I was doing. They said, oh, no, I couldn't do that. I'd be mad all the time, you know? But that's And you weren't, because, just to be clear, you, you, you were able to keep those alarms off to the degree that think you we were productively engaging. Oh, yeah. I was actually thrilled to do it. Thrilled to be, actually, I'm an opinionated person in truth. And, and so it was kind of healing for me to be able to set myself that far aside. It's not that you do it forever. I came home, people asked if your politics changed. No, not one ounce. Have I changed? Yes, very profoundly. I feel bigger, I'm more related to people that I, I didn't know before, and I'm more actually sensitive to social class prejudice. Huh. You know, I, I'm always alert to racial prejudice, but social class prejudice? No, I, I came back learning about that. And uh, how, just to finish the story about the, um, the uh, gospel singer, one part I forgot to say is she said, you know why I really love Rush Limbaugh, this super culture weaponizer, is because he protects me from people on the coasts and liberals uh, that look down on me, that I'm Southern, that I'm ill-educated, that I'm racist and sexist and homophobic and fat. And, and he's protecting me from that. Well, I learned a ton, you know, so I think it's just who we address our capacity to empathize to. It's not a question of huh. a paucity. Because we all do capacity. it with somebody. Yeah. We all are able to empathize if we're with our kids yeah. or, or yeah. our, our spots. How Even kids do it well. Karen, uh, I, 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 to what degree, I mean, do you look for these fights in India? Like, do you sometimes get, do you, are you exhausted that they have to happen all the time? Do you just want to do your art and, and not have to worry about it? Or having grown up there, do you get that stuff, art's politicized, culture is politicized in India? No, I'm kind of used to it now, Ali. I think that the way it is, it's happened to me thrice in my career. I've had to fight three kind of situations to do with my films. Mm. One was to do with the, 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 the mispronunciation of the city that I live in. It's now Mumbai, but it used to be Bombay. Mm -hmm. right. And there was a film that I released way back in October 2008, uh, where the lead protagonist of the film called the, film, called the city Bombay. And uh, the film was like, the, 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 it was threatened by a political party that they would vandalize any cinema hall that played the film because the character called it Bombay. And I even went to the powers to be to kind of request them. And uh, the gentleman who came with me uh, even said, oh, sir, it's a case of colloquial parlance. But of course, that gentleman was not about to listen no. to any kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of reasoning. And then it happened to me with My Name is Khan, um, when a film that I released in 2010, which spoke about the misrepresentation of Islam as a result of what had happened post 9-11. And there was a backlash that I had to combat. The film was banned in the state of Maharashtra for various reasons. And, uh, and then it happened with Adil Mushkil where I cast a Pakistani actor. And again, it was like that I'm being non-Indian oh, and I'm, yeah. being, uh, I'm, being not, I'm not being patriotic.
chaotic. And I remember I had to put out literally a hostage video um, where I had to apologize and I had to say it because the studio wanted me to do that because uh, they felt that it was the right thing to do to communicate my patriotism. It made me feel very little. It made me feel very small. Uh, you, you were forced. I was, well, I was asked that that's the only way the film would release if I had to you say were forced by that the economic I am pressures. patriotic, I am nationalistic in my sentiment, and by me casting a Pakistani actor, it was not that it was a reflection of my patriotic spirit. Yeah. And after that, and if you ask me today, I would never do that again, yeah. because it was such an error of judgment. And I felt small, I felt tiny, I felt cornered, and I felt terrible that I had to, it was, a, a, my film was a love story. It spoke about unrequited love, it spoke about emotion, and I'd cast a brilliant actor. Yeah. And, you know, and I always say that art has no boundaries. Artists should not have boundaries. What happens on the political arena should not reflect on decisions that we make creatively. But then culture is thrown at us. Yeah. You know, patriotism is thrown at us. And it's thrown at us and we seem to be accountable to those forces. So when you ask me that, you know, am I looking for a fight? No, I'm not. Yes. My alarms are always on, unfortunately. I have really learned a lot by hearing you because suddenly it gave me perspective. You know, I feel like I have to have that alarm to be able to kind of understand, you know, when we have people like, you know, who kind of throw culture on home, say homosexuality, you know, when they say it's not our culture to be homosexual, it really angers me because I believe in equality. And there are those forces and, and there are those groups that say things like this and it's out there and those leaders are given a platform and it really angers me and yet then you wonder if you really say what's in your heart and soul, whether you can go back home safe or you'll have some kind of a legality thrown out at you and you'll have to fight that. I've had about 20 FIRs, you know, oh. for things that I've said in my films, comments that have been made. And it's not that I make, I'm meant to be like a peaceful filmmaker who makes yeah. like, like, like basically yeah. mainstream entertainers for wholesome family uh, audiences. Yeah. But yet somehow or the other, I seem to land up in the lap of trouble all the time. But and you're an artist. Yes. You, yes. And I, I think Design. that politicians like me, and, and especially ministers of culture, our, our, our main purpose is to safeguard yes. artists. Yes. And that is the best thing that we can do for democracy. And for and our people. And ma'am, that is such a beautiful thing to say. And we live by people like you. We, you give us strength. Well, you give us hope. You know, and I think that it, it, there, are, uh, there are men and women like you who think like you makes us feel like we can continue doing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. We can express on celluloid exactly what we want and we don't feel restricted. But unfortunately, we have circumstances that don't always support us. Yo-Yo, wow. you, you have uh, been dealing with this type of stuff and I, I'd be interested in your experiences because uh, almost 20 years ago you decided to create art. It wasn't meant to be controversial. Uh, like, like you're saying, your stuff wasn't, isn't by design controversial. Not at all. Uh, but there must be some people who said, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you up to? Why are you bringing things together that shouldn't be together? <laughs> Apples and pears, as they say in Sweden. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Well, um, I think what's interesting is, well, for me, the work is to turn what someone says is mine into ours, right? I think, and the more I've looked into different cultures, the more, the deeper you look, the more you find the world. Because you, at one layer, maybe it seems this culture has nothing to do with any other place. But you dig a little bit, a couple hundred years, a couple thousand years, it's all there. And so my question always is how, you know, when we talk about culture, often we think of it like as something static. Mm -hmm. You know, the weaponization of culture. Well, I think culture is actually, was invented by humans. In fact, all of culture was invented by humans. That's a recent realization. And for certain purposes, to one, to understand our environment, two, to understand who we are, and three, to understand others. So if, that, if we believe in that, then the next step is to think about, well, uh, culture, we invented culture, so if we don't like something, who, why are we not trying to change it? And given new evidence, new facts, new truths, why can't we, you know, we're not in, we're not in a little box. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, think, I think 
very often we're educated to think uh, to be specialists because that's the best way to find a job, right? You can't, but it used to be that people were generalists and knew a lot of things. Yeah, right. But now we're kind of like, you know, more and more, it's STEM, STEAM, what? You know, it's, it's, it's as if these things are not connected. And that, to me, is very sad because I think uh, the, the very innovation and creativity that we seek to dig ourselves out of the troubles that we face come from, um, from people who actually know different things. Very often you don't get you know, new thinking coming from the depth of one area. If I look at this panel. Right, quite varied. You all have many existences, many layers of it, and I'm sure you use them to do your work well. Right? I mean, I, I don't need to go further. So, so to me, it's kind of strange to, to, to have a title like, you know, the weaponization of culture, because culture is about understanding. I, I knew that would be strange yeah, to you, yeah, yeah. Uh, because like I said, you're the opposite. You, you can't, I don't even think you can conceptualize of the weaponization of culture, because you're, well, you're, what you read as culture is only something that should be understood and shared by people. Because, because what Arlie's work is good because she started from the inside of a culture. I, I think for me, anytime you look at a group of people or, or a, a discipline, you have to start from the inside. And Arlie has a wonderful story of, of a student who said, oh, I know who you can talk to. My mother, whose best friend is someone in the tea party. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, those were your guides. And I, I would wager that all of us, going into our different fields, of, uh, were guided there by somebody who took us inside. So let me take that. Uh, down, uh, let, let me go for, forward with a question that I wanted to ask. And, and you're free, by the way, to uh, respond to it uh, at uh, wef.ch uh, slash Oh, I've lost it. <laughs> slash ask. Got a small brain. Forget sense. these things. Weft.ch slash ask. What, what you just said, Yo-Yo, and, and what you have all been talking about and what Arlie went and did in Louisiana is uh, you use the word empathy, but let me just use uh, this concept of tolerance, which is something we, we, right. we talk about a lot. Are you talking about being tolerant of someone's intolerance in order to meet on that bridge of empathy? Do we have to be tolerant of intolerance? Because I think that's part of the problem. Whatever side of this yeah. debate you're on, gotcha. you don't want to validate right. that other person's view, which might be, uh, might be bigoted, in your opinion, or it might be uh, something that attacks you. How do you deal with that? Yeah, what you want to do is open up. It, it, what you want to do is set down a preliminary human layer uh, of interaction that's respectful with liking and to open up what would be a prejudice. Um, I think, uh, you know, I've been very inspired by uh, Yo-Yo's work with the Silk uh, Road and um, in a way, and the turning mys into our, I, I um, and this relates to your experience too. Um, there is a, um, um, a feminist from Morocco, um, Muslim, named Fatima Mernisi. She's no longer with us, but she uh, was best-selling author and uh, wrote a book on women in Islam, very controversial and so on. And, she knew that a lot of um, Moroccans were migrating to Italy, and Italy was prejudiced right, against Muslims, frightened of them. Uh, the men were, you know, uh, uh, dangerous. The women didn't speak, and so on. There were these prejudices. So she went with a sort of a silk route thing. It, she went to. Um, uh, she brought with her a, a, a caravan civic, 
a human rights activist, an environmentalist, a, uh, um, a woman working on the Code Familial, and so on, and, um, and musicians. And she, so she was doing this, quote, book tour, but she was taking along this group so that the uh, ideas would change. And one of the performances, as they went from city to city down uh, Italy, uh, was a man who was a traditional, uh, who, who did very uh, traditional um, Moroccan music. And he had very traditional outfit with slippers that kind of um, looked like elves. They sort of came up. He was very elegant. And he began with this atonal music that people couldn't relate to. You know, ah, uh, 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 it, was, it was atonal. And, but people were listening respectfully and trying to get into it. The next song he did was a little less atonal. It had to do with the Spanish influence uh, and the melange, the new, the new ways music went together. And people felt it was a little more familiar. And then the next tune, uh, people were tapping their, their, their feet. And in a way, it was educational for everybody. They could see, oh, these aren't so different. There was a, the me's turn into an hour. Mm -hmm. And I thought we just need to do that all over that the <laughs> whole World Economic Forum ought to develop Ooh. ways in which we have caravan civiques. I'm sorry Fatima isn't here to lead it ourselves, but maybe we could continue To that. some I degree. Uh, Yo's work does. But I, but I think it, we put so many different things into the word tolerance and intolerance. I mean, uh, uh, as many as we are here, we have different it means different things for us. Mm -hmm. But I think as a politician and as part of a, a cabinet, a government, I think we need to be very, very tolerant because what's, what's the, what more do we have to choose about? I mean, is it war? I mean, so I mean, we have to be very tolerant against intolerance. Uh, and then in the end, we have the rule of law. <laughs> We have uh, 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 the, the, the judge system and so on and so forth. But until that, mm. so it's a very gray scale. We need to be very tolerant so that we can meet and have this discussion so that the me can be our. So Karen, uh, the idea that uh, you can be friends with someone who shares a different political interest, saying that my mother is a Democrat, is very different than saying my mother's a homophobe or my sister's a racist. Um, so when we talk about the degree to which we have to understand tolerance and build bridges uh, uh, to empathy, and I say this knowing that you do this in your, in your practice, so it's a bit of a rhetorical question, right. but when confronted with the threats and the social media attacks and things like this that you think are, are sort of silly, and, and to the minister's point, you know, we demean real problems when we, right. when we focus on some of these small things. Uh, how do you do that? Putting aside the fact that you don't want to do another hostage video to prove your patriotism, how do you build that bridge? You know, I went through stages with when you talk about social media trolling, and I can just speak for myself. It started off with anger. It went on to uh, indifference. And finally, I'm at amusement because that's the only way I can deal with it. Uh, every morning when I go onto my timeline and I'm abused for something or the other, either I'm accused of, um, uh, of they think that of my orientation or the work I do or my fashion choices or the things I say or the films I make, it could be anything when I'm trolled or spoken about and when culture is thrown at me as like this is un-Indian or this is not right, I just, now I'm amused. Now when I'm not trolled, I almost feel like something's wrong. <laughs> like, you weren't provocative like, enough. I feel, I feel like, oh my God, why is nobody abusing me this morning, something's got to be wrong. Uh, so, and I think the only way to, for me to deal with it is like I can't validate it and I'm certainly not, I don't plan to be tolerant to this intolerance if it was thrown at my face because sometimes when you are tolerant to that intolerance, it's, it's misconstrued as validation. Yes. And, oh, that's interesting. And, and I think that is something that I would not want to okay. kind of communicate in any form. So. What I can do is amuse myself by, and you know, people say, oh, you can block them. I don't like to block them. 
I like to, re I'm kind of, I'm kind of like, I like that kind of self-inflicted torture sometimes. Mm. It kind of grounds me in a way. It makes me believe that, you know, it's good to be abused once in a while. My mother was very kind to me all her life. So was my father. I was the only child. I was kind of indulged and spoiled. So it's so toughening I you up now, a little bit. I've been raised, I've been raised with by, uh, by completely by the rigid world of social media. And I'm okay with it because I know that they're lonely people and they don't know better. It, it, I, I do have a question from the audience. How does social media technology <laughs> hinder or improve a culture's capacity to practice the necessary tolerance for others to understand each other? Uh, it's, a, it's a very astute question because you're covering all, all sides of it, but one would argue at the, in the beginning of social media when you were still studying this, it probably sounded like a good idea. Probably sounded like, oh, now we're all gonna be able to talk, yeah. to have yeah. this conversation yeah. freely. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure I see that today. No. No, no. Not, not at all. all. No. Oh, but, okay, but then I can take the other side because I really want to defend <laughs> social media. <laughs> because I, I also think that we need to take the hard way. I mean, the technology gives us so much possibilities, not at least the people living in, still in developing countries where the social media is the only channel to to have contact with the world and to speak out what's happening in their neighborhood. So even though there comes a lot of hatred and other problems with social media, with Twitter, with Facebook, with everything, I think we need to uh, develop tools to battle the problems with the technology and the social media because in itself I would defend it every day yeah. because it, right. I think it's fantastic. But you know, one thing I found, um, <laughs> is uh, <clears throat> when I would talk with people, they would be open. I'll give you an example, one guy um, who opens the book. And uh, he, uh, when I asked him, I was back there a few months ago, well, what do you think about Trump? Is there anything that disturbs you? He was hugely enthusiastic about Trump at first time. He said, well, what disturbs me about Trump? Where do I begin? He says, okay. But I look at his Facebook page, you know, social media, mm -hmm. and it's just slam, and he's, he's, it's like a proclamation. He's tough, and So he's pro-Trump in his social media. Yes. But he told you there are lots but, of things that yes, bother him about Trump. And, and so we have to really get, you're right to get skills. I, I'm not for giving Facebook up, but wow. Mm. <laughs> and no wonder, yeah. he just looks so tougher. I have a question for all of us. Were we born tolerant? Were we born? I'd say, I guess, yes. Yeah. Tolerant? I mean, do we have moments of intolerance in ourselves that we somehow uh, decide, hmm, maybe not? I don't think we were born tolerant. What, do, what does the scientist As long as I was say? fed, I was tolerant. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, and I'm, I'm barely a musician. But, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, listen. Uh, I, I'm just wondering, I'm thinking of what goes on in our brains during the day when we were younger and how we may have changed in our views over the years mm -hmm. and, and how it's a complex process to get to the point of saying, I am this, I'm a homophobe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's also complex to get out of that process. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think in some ways, it, but maybe tolerance is connected to, to context. Uh, Brecht say, said, uh, first uh, bread, then moral. Uh, so maybe it depends on where we are in life and what, and, and what uh, context we live That's in, if we're tolerant but or not. I think, um, in a way, empathically, children um, grow down. I think they start by being very tolerant, very empathic. They, they, they feel sorry for the dog and the cat and the goldfish, and then they learn how not to feel sorry for just a, a goldfish. And I, I think, in a way, um, we we start off okay if you we're fed. You know? But if you look at uh, the U.S. election, if you look at Brexit, if you look at uh, influences in various European elections over the last five years, the to your point, the economic and financial struggles, the struggles to one's prosperity, have been fairly directly correlated to an increase in intolerance and to some of these, I know you don't like to use the word cultural wars. So it, I don't know, and I, I would have to go back and study this, but 
Are we happier, are we less intolerant when we're fat and happy, when we're fed, when we're not struggling for the basics? When we're not anxious about the basics. When we're not, yes. Okay. I mean, you can yeah. be rich and anxious <laughs> um, if, when we're not humiliated, uh, when we're not fearful, uh, yeah, then okay. we're more That's tolerant. It. Fear is a huge, huge, huge part of the weaponization of culture. Yeah. Because, and since Davos talked so much about the incredible changes that are happening and will happen, yeah. fourth industrial revolution, all of this, so change is with us for a huge, for a very long time. Yeah. A lot of people are afraid. But then we're back to trust about the green spot. Yeah. No, you see. This conversation is going all right. 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 I was really worried it wasn't going to work out. <laughs> but now we're back to your, to your picture. Because let's you said let's that put that up if we can. If I can ask the control room to because put the Venn diagram I was thinking now what, what you said. Because I was thinking, what does this tell us then? Because then we're back to this screen where economics, politi politics, and culture meet. Mm -hmm. Because then we need to invest in culture, in cultural freedom. We need to defend our artists even right. more. And we need to put those leaders, politicians like me, who, does, who only speak nice words like I do now, you need to check me up that I'm really doing it also for right. real. Yeah. Because uh, otherwise, I am not uh, creating the circumstances that uh, artists and the culture needs to be that green spot. Well, I, I would say that it's, um, I'm sorry for interrupting, no, no, I was going to say, that I think, you know, it's all great to say we should have more culture, more artists, whatever. I think everybody needs to find ways, better ways to work together. That includes artists. It's really easy to sit in a group of any one you know, group of people, whether it's po politicians, or business people, or artists, and say, oh, nobody else understands. And that's not good, because, because if you ha are going to be in that green spot, you really need to understand the frames of thinking of another person from another discipline, from another, because otherwise, mm -hmm. you're not going to have, mm -hmm. you're going to be using the same words that will have right. different meanings. Mm -hmm. You've got to build a lot of these terrible. bridges the vocabulary to empathy, to not, I think. I don't let know. me go out to the audience. Uh, we have mics here somewhere, I believe. Uh, let me see where we have them. Where do we have microphones? All right, there we go. We've got a microphone over there. Just show me your hand. There we go, right here in the uh, middle of the second row and then over to where you are closer. We'll just pass that mic over to you. Thank you for this. And uh, Mr. Ma, if you're barely a musician, I'm barely human. So <laughs> well said. get that on the table. Wow, well you said. actually oh. look quite human. Yeah. <laughs> uh, intolerance. My work is to end violence against women. I don't know how to be tolerant of somebody beating a woman. And I am not anxious and I am not fearful. I'm just pissed off that it is still happening. And I don't know anybody who could convince me to be tolerant right. about people who insist on beating up women and children. Mm -hmm. I, if one of you can tell me how to do it, I'm happy to do it. But I don't know how to find tolerance in that. No. But that's against the law. Yeah. There comes the, I mean, when I was speaking about being... At least in many being, places. Uh, when I was speaking about being very tolerant, uh, uh, it was to the line when it's against the law. In then, some places, it's not against the law. Uh, no. But it should be human. Mm. That no, no right. human should you beat another human. Violence. So this is a great example. This is a great example of... Uh, taking your work, which I think when you talk about it, we all believe, we all want to do what you did, be able to turn off our alarms and build those bridges to empathy. What, this is an interesting point, because in some places it's absolutely illegal, and if it comes up to the line of being illegal, you don't want to say, well, it's okay if you don't really beat them, you're just a little rough on them. We, we, we generally don't want to be tolerant of a, sentiments, a sentiment of violence toward women, and to your point about the Me Too movement, it is engendered in that, right? right. If, if you have a fundamental disrespect for women, it's going to lead to all sorts of things from, the, from harassment all the way possibly to violence. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with not wanting to be tolerant of something that you think is just going down a bad road? Right. Um, I totally uh, get it, what you're saying, empathize with it. I think the answer is we need two channels of activism. And one of the channels is to... Uh, obey, uphold the law, and uh, 
just stop that behavior. And the other channel is um, uh, exemplified by some work done uh, by men against violence against women. For example, it's an Oakland-based group, and what they do is go around and talk with men who are violent with women. And there are some psychologists that have found some amazing things that they, the man might say, oh, I just got mad, you know. Actually, what happens is there's some rehearsal. He's driving his truck home. You know, it's been a terrible day. He's worried about losing respect from the other guys in the, in the office. He's about to take it out on his wife, and he's thinking, oh, she didn't cook her scrambled egg good this, well this morning, and so on. He's rehearsing the violent act, and then enacts it. OK. Well, so this guy, this group, is going around uh, talking to men um, and helping them get themselves. So you've got two channels of activism, not one. Very interesting. I want to just get a response from you on that. Huh? OK, so we're doing that. I'm doing that in India. It's not making a hell of a difference. We, we have people on the ground. We are including the men and boys in the conversation. And when they're in the room, it's OK. I know it's theoretical. Yes, I shouldn't hit my wife. And we go home. And the mother-in-law is saying, she didn't do this, and she didn't do that. And now the man, he hasn't rehearsed a damn thing. He just doesn't want mom on his ass. Oh, god, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a good so, thing this isn't being streamed you know, live right now. <laughs> Actually, you know, to answer to go it's back to even right what, what Yo-Yo said about like, you know, how we born tolerant. Actually, I'm a parent now, and I have, I have twins who are nearly a year old. And I think that they're, they're, they're born intolerant to many things. They are lactose intolerant. They're happy ration intolerant. They're intolerant. And I think that is, of course, a technicality. But I think what, what even you, ma'am, are talking what about, it really talks about uh, parenting. And I think what children see their fathers do, yes. they grow up to being those men. Mm -hmm. And it's a vicious cycle. And so I think what is very imperative is to actually counsel parents in countries from a very young age. Because the ideologies, the theories, the thinking, the beliefs, all of that is what designs men and women to be eventually. Exactly. So if the culture has to be, the culture has to be adequate, correct, rightful humanitarian parenting. And I think that therein lies an adequate solution. And Great. added to the schooling. Yes. You know, it should yeah. be in the schools. When the board proposes, if before the woman says yes, she could say, do you think you have the right to hit me? I think we could fix a lot of it. Yes. Right. How oh, that's uh, good. Let me take this question from a gentleman right at the end here. They're just going to. OK, there we go. you got a mic there. Yes, thank just, you. Just uh, if you could identify yourself, please. Uh, sure, Gregory Warner from NPR. Thanks a lot for this panel and uh, your time. Fascinating uh, discussion. So a key idea that all of you have been talking about is this idea that um, our cultural differences are not as important. They're not as sharp as in the public sphere as, as, as we make them out to be. And uh, that they're small and that there are more important things that we should be talking about. You know, that these are a distraction from the real issues. But it feels to me like uh, that's not, uh, I mean, at least <laughs> In terms of the countries that are represented here, that's not how most people feel. Um, more and more cultures being debated. Now, maybe they're wrong to debate it. Maybe they're debating it wrongly. But I guess it feels often that the culture is a shorthand for something deeper, value differences. And so I'm curious uh, from the panelists, any, any specific examples where you've seen uh, not just individual examples of tolerance, but uh, the weaponization de-weaponized? You know, where it's actually de-weaponized on a grander scale. Maybe not the whole country, but a, uh, a larger good question. than one person. I'm going to ask the panelists to uh, limit their responses to 30 seconds just because we're at the end of the, the circuit. But I think it's a fantastic question. Uh, you start. I haven't quite comprehended the question entirely, so I think some people should. I think that's one example of where it's, where it's worked, where, where you've seen the de-weaponization of culture. Right. Uh, do you have anything to say to that? Yeah, I think... Um, that may be the fundamental I, 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 problem. We don't, <laughs> we're, not, we're not brimming with examples. <laughs> two, um, two separate things. I think you're right that culture uh, is something in itself because it's a basis of honor. And that's really a bottom line for, for much of life. At the same time, um, culture can be used to displace people's feelings. For example, 
in, in my work, the, the people I came to know thought that blacks and women were cutting ahead of them in line for good jobs because of federally mandated affirmative action programs. And they were mad at that. Whereas, in fact, um, I, it, automation is what really is the, the big thing, cutting in line for these folks. So that's an example of displaced culture. I have to wrap this up. It is, uh, we're out of time. I, I really tried to convince the World Economic Forum that we needed two and a half hours for this, uh, and we really do. Um, I cannot thank you enough. It is such an important conversation that we've had, and uh, as Yo-Yo said, you, you all individually bring so much diversity to the, the topic, and it is the topic of our time. So I want to thank you for the work that you've all done. I want to thank you uh, in the room and those of you out there who have joined us on the live stream uh, on the internet. Uh, for your participation, and if I can just ask that we keep this conversation going because this is probably the issue of our time. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.